We've been discussing over the past year or so now how geopolitics and mining are getting more and more intertwined in the news cycle. I mean, as I commented maybe a year ago, six months to a year ago now, they always have been. (laughs) They always have been. You know, natural resources, energy, metals, and geopolitics. In other words, we might say war. They always have been intertwined. But, you know, this morning I was listening to Stratfor, one of the more prominent geopolitical think tanks, and they are discussing nickel ore, you know, and the situation in Indonesia, a topic that we were discussing last week based on that story in the Financial Times that Indonesia wants to create a OPEC-style cartel for dealing with nickel. Now, the addition from the Stratfor podcast, which was interesting that I didn't read in that FT article, was that Indonesia wants to refine the nickel in Indonesia because they were just selling the raw you know, nickel and then other places were processing it. And apparently, just like with oil, a lot of the business and a lot of the benefit of having these natural resources is in the processing of them. So it was just very interesting to see Stratfor, you know, h- highlighting it front and center. So h- hello and welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast, where getting to know the metals ahead of time will give you an edge even geopolitically, I guess, is the moral of the story. It's also election day in the U.S., so that should be interesting to watch, particularly with energy front and center and you know inflation and everything else, which we also know commodities, metals, and energy are deeply intertwined with. So an interesting landscape here. I mean, you are starting to see a little bit of fracturing. Speaking about geopolitics, there do seem to be some frays that are building in the transatlantic relationship here between Europe and the U.S., this Inflation Act apparently has a Buy America provision, which is seriously concerning Germany and France, because they're concerned, rightly so, in my view, that they are going to be deindustrialized, you know, turned into a rust belt of the European continent if incentives are given to European companies who are already struggling from high energy prices, if they are given incentive to move over to the U.S. in a Buy America clause to set up their automobile manufacturing. I mean, it is remarkable. You know, I'm 43. I feel like a fairly younger person where I'm kind of realizing a lot of things. Like, I'm kind of amazed at how important, for example, the automotive industry is to our economy and to the world. And to me, I kind of step back and wonder what that means. Like, how have we become so dependent on cars? But maybe I'm just on my own wondering these questions. Maybe you think it's quite clear as to why that is. But sometimes I just wonder those big, strange questions to myself. So there's another huge kind of revelation, which may come as no surprise to many of you, I'm sure, in this really interesting interview I did with Jeff Olson, president and CEO of Port Longyear. I almost hesitate to mention it because I feel like I should have known this having worked 10 years at a mining newspaper, but I'll mention it anyway because I actually do imagine there are a lot of people who might be just as surprised as I was. And it is a fabulous interview. I learned in that interview, and again, no surprise to many of you, that when you are drilling as a mining company, most of the time you're contracting out Port Longyear or another uh, supplier another drilling company, and that they are providing the employees. And I just always assumed, and they say never assume, I always just imagined that those people working those drill rigs belong to the company. And once I learned that, it was a big, of course, of course it works that way. Why are you, you know, as a some of these mining companies are two people, maybe five people. Are you going to keep a driller on staff for you know, 12 months a year when you need them for about two or three or four weeks a year? Of course not. Not if you can avoid it. And Bort Longyear works from the biggest to the smallest mining companies. And it may sound like a sponsored show, but it is not a sponsored show. Their PR people reached out to me, but I took them up on it a month and a half ago. 
uh, just because I thought, let's see what Bort Longyear has to say. If the CEO wants to talk to us, great. And so Jeff talked to us. So we have that to look forward to. Other than that, I mean, if we look at the markets here, it's really interesting, I find. Like the numbers tell their own story, don't they? The U.S. 10-year bond is back at 4.189%. I think we could call that pretty high. Again, 4.189%. We're almost at 4.2% on the U.S. 10-year. The U.K. 10-year, the gilt, is at 362 so edging up a little bit from last week. And if we turn to gold, gold is at 1,676. So we might say treading water. Silver is above $20. A lot of people are bullish on silver, as we've mentioned before, $20.85. Copper is at $3.64 per pound. Oil is quite elevated, though. I mean, it really is one thing to look at all of the headlines. And then you look at the actual numbers, and they really do tell their own story. So oil here, West Texas Intermediate at $91. Brent crude, often considered a more international oil price. I believe that'd be like Europe often buys Brent crude if I had to hazard a educated guess. $97.29, so a pretty big spread there. We're talking about over $6 spread between Brent crude and West Texas Intermediate. And that gas in the last 24 hours down 7% at $6.46. That is U.S. natural gas. So pretty interesting landscape. The markets kind of feel like they want to rally. I guess technically the Santa Claus rally is like the last week of the year and the first two days of the following year, but kind of has become this you know general term for the last you know five or six weeks of the year, everybody waiting for the Santa Claus rally. So it feels like the markets want to do that. But I mean, again, uncertainty reigns, which to me feeds into this idea that it actually could go higher. And climbing that wall of worry, I would be a little more concerned if everything looked perfect for a rally. Then I would probably start to think this is going down. Who knows? I have zero clue. You know, financially on a personal level, I'm just kind of sticking to what I already have been doing. And that's not financial advice. So with that, I we have a wonderful program and some fascinating news items coming up here. And finally, the Canadian Mining Symposium is coming up. Just go to events.northernminer.com and register your interest. It is in London, UK. And if you go to events.northernminer.com, you can request your investor pass. And this is generally for basically professional investors. And we have a fantastic lineup there with Sean Boyd, Phil Baker, Ira Thomas, and Nadine Miller as the headliners, and many more. So with that, if you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. Find us on Twitter at Northern Miner and on Instagram at The Northern Miner, and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts and wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud. And with that, let's turn to the news. And turning to the website, China opposes Canada's order on lithium mining investments. So this is Reuters via mining.com. So you might remember our story from last week where Canada brought out some very tough regulation in order to protect its critical minerals, forcing China to divest a lot of their investments. So China has replied. And according to Reuters, China on Sunday said it will take the necessary steps to safeguard the rights and interests of its companies after Canada last week ordered three Chinese companies to divest their investments in Canadian critical minerals, citing national security. In a statement, China's Commerce Ministry said it urged Canada to stop politicizing economic and trade issues. And unfortunately, my friends, that is the end of the story. So the story is, is they are going to do something. OK, maybe that's good that that story was so short because we have a ton of stories to get through here. Ontario Mines Minister Georges Piri targets red tape for Ring of Fire. And this is by Colin McClellan at the Northern Miner. Ontario Mines Minister George Piri, a 35-year mining industry veteran before his election in June, says he plans to consider cutting project red tape, quote, fairly shortly, end quote, while encouraging more federal investment 
in the Ring of Fire. Piri, who served as head of Placer Dome Canada in the years before its acquisition by Barrick Gold in 2006, says Ontario has potential to displace the foreign output of some minerals needed in the multi-trillion dollar global transition to clean energy, but projects can't take 12 to 15 years for approval. Amen. A big part of what we're doing is looking at the red tape that's inherent in our system. We'll be talking about that fairly shortly. Puree declined to elaborate on timing or details, but a ministry spokesman said Puree is, quote, hopeful, end quote, about Federal Natural Resources Minister Jonathan Wilkinson suggesting recently that provincial and federal project approval processes should run simultaneously to save time. Ottawa and the provinces and territories are starting meetings soon to hammer out mining policies. Yeah, pretty wild, isn't it? I mean, the implication here is that first the provincial is moving and then the federal moves after that, that they don't work uh, at the same time, both the federal and provincial agencies. That's remarkable. No wonder it takes so long. At stake for Ontario is the development of the Ring of Fire 500 kilometers northeast of Thunder Bay, estimates of its economic potential vary wildly and depend on basic infrastructure being developed, but the potential is real and Piri suggests it could be worth up to $1 trillion. Wasn't it Dalton McGinty who called it like the oil sands of Ontario or something like that? And it's probably true. The province wants to develop the area to feed southern Ontario manufacturing hubs with minerals such as lithium, cobalt, copper, and nickel needed for electric vehicle batteries and other industries and renewable energy. You know, again, I do step back and I just wonder to myself, like, are we doing all of this just for vehicles? And I know that might sound pedestrian to some, like, who dares would ask such a question, but it does, it, I just find it remarkable, like, we are living for our cars here, is the implication. Enough of my editorializing. Feel free to leave a comment. I, I understand many would disagree with that comment there. And finally, the area's most advanced project is Ring of Fire Metals Eagle Nest. Now, Ring of Fire Metals is what used to be Wailu and Noront, and Wailu took it over. They are now called Ring of Fire Metals, interestingly. So you can read the whole story on northernminer.com. That is just a fragment. Industry groups welcome $10 billion in Ottawa's budget update, also by Colin McClellan. Canada's major mining industry group and green energy think tanks are welcoming nearly $10 billion spread over tax credits for clean technology, mining project approval improvements, innovation research, and industry training announced in a federal budget update. So it's interesting, mining project approval improvements. So this is really, you know, we've been hammering away at this for probably a couple of years here as the main issue. Uh, I remember Anthony Vaccaro, Northern Miner Group president, was mentioning this is one of the top, if not the top things he hears at mining conferences is the mining project approval delays is the biggest concern. So it appears it's on the radar from what I'm reading in this story and last. Ottawa is offering $6.7 billion in tax credits over five years for up to 30% of investments in clean technologies such as battery storage electric industrial vehicles, and small nuclear reactors, according to the Liberal government's fall economic statement issued Thursday. It also gives $1.28 billion over six years to several federal departments, including the Impact Assessment Agency, to speed the project approvals process, $962 million over eight years to modernize the National Research Council, and $800 million over three years for the Youth Employment and Skills Strategy. And finally, we have a quote from Pierre Graton, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Mining Association of Canada, who said in a news release, quote, This investment tax credit will serve to benefit Canada's mining industry in several ways, as the deployment of zero-emission vehicles and non-greenhouse gas emission solutions is accelerating across our sector. This tax credit will support our sector in accomplishing its climate action priorities. You can read the whole article on northernminer.com. As well, the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame has announced their 2023 inductees, and they include Jim Cooney, who championed the concept of sustainable development and pioneered the application of policies and procedures to improve the industry's social and environmental performance. Alexander John Davidson, who contributed to the remarkable success of Barrick Gold as it evolved from its North American base into the world's leading gold producer. And also Douglas Belfour Silver, 
who rose to prominence in the early 1990s as president and owner of Balfour Holdings, which became a leading mineral economics and management consulting firm. So only three this year, which is interesting. I guess there is no set number on that. So if you're looking for more information, just go to miningholloffame.ca. The Northern Miner is a co-founding member organization of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame, and their tickets will go on sale for the event in March of next year. And it takes place on May 24th, 2023 at the Carlew in Toronto, a must-attend event for the mining industry, especially those based in Toronto. Continuing on, now we've had the guys from Deep Green Mining on the program before, and deep sea mining sounded, according to them, like a super environmental thing to do. But here we have an article from Bloomberg News, more governments are turning against the rush to mine the deep sea. And it says here, as world leaders gather at the United Nations Climate Summit in Egypt this week, another international meeting is underway in Jamaica to decide the fate of the planet's oceans. This is by Todd Woody at Bloomberg News. The UN-affiliated International Seabed Authority is convening in Kingston to fast-track regulations that could allow the mining of fragile and biodiverse deep-sea ecosystems for valuable metals as soon as 2024. But as the ISA Council, the organization's policymaking body, concluded its first week of meetings on Friday, a growing number of countries were calling for a halt to the rush to enact mining regulations by July 2023, a deadline established last year. Among the Council's 36 member states, Germany, France, Spain, Costa Rica, New Zealand, Chile, Panama, Fiji, and the federal states of Micronesia last week demanded a, quote, precautionary pause, end quote, or a moratorium on mining due to a lack of scientific data on the areas of the seabed targeted for exploitation. On Monday at COP27 in Egypt, French President Emmanuel Macron called for an outright ban on deep sea mining. Meanwhile, Brazil, the Netherlands, Portugal, Singapore, Switzerland, and other council members also indicated they would not approve any mining contracts until sufficient environmental protections for unique deep ocean ecosystems are in place regardless of the July deadline. I mean, it sounds like there were just these nodules at the bottom of the sea made of metal. At least that was the story I heard, and it's simply a matter of just picking these up off the bottom of the sea. I mean, put it this way, you know, and what do I know about this stuff? But to me, it seems like fishing with these nets sounds like a billion times more destructive to me than simply picking up some metal balls off the bottom of the ocean. I don't see people, you know, outline fishing or nets for that matter, these huge nets that just collect everything, but we're going to ban picking up these metal nodules off the bottom of the sea. Okay. This is very interesting here as we wrap up the news section. Mystery whales baffle gold market after central bank purchases Bloomberg News. And I just want to read the first few paragraphs here because this is interesting. We mentioned the record gold buying last week, but look at this. Again, this is Bloomberg News via mining.com. A normally dry research report jolted the gold market this week when it pointed to massive but so far unidentified sovereign buyers. That just smacks of geopolitics, doesn't it? Central banks bought 399 tons of bullion in the third quarter, almost double the previous record, according to the World Gold Council. Just under a quarter went to publicly identified institutions, stoking speculation about mystery buyers. So only a quarter of the buying of this record amount, double the previous record, only a quarter of it we know where it went. To which sovereigns? To which countries? While most central banks inform the International Monetary Fund when they buy gold to supplement their foreign exchange coffers, others are more secretive. And this is something that Jeffrey Christian has repeated over and over again, the secretive nature of the precious metals market, as he puts it. If you have the capacity to undertake the third quarter buying spree, enough to soften the blow from investors selling bullion as the Federal Reserve hiked interest rates. So they're implying there are some pretty big buyers. I mean, again, we hear all these rumors of a brick currency and, you know, we have some circumstantial evidence. Uh, Jeffrey Christian thought that is basically, you know, hot air for the most part, this whole Uh, brick currency idea, but we are seeing some circumstantial evidence. We are hearing, again, confirmation of these stories that gold is going from west to east. Now, Jeffrey says that's a natural thing and it will reverse in course. Uh, Let's continue with this article. 
And we have a quote from Ross Norman, Chief Executive Officer of Metals Daily. Quote, with that weight of selling, I was a bit surprised gold wasn't weaker, but I suppose now we have our answer. And it looks like here the main suspects are China, Russia, oil exporters, and India. That's the people they kind of examine in the rest of this article. You can read the whole thing on mining.com. Plot thickens on the gold market. It's like an Agatha Christie novel here. And finally, India's massive silver demand cutting world's warehouse stocks. So massive demand. Maybe it's India. Who knows? Because they're buying a huge amount of silver. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. Indian silver consumption is forecast to surge by around 80% to a record this year as traders draw down inventories in warehouses from London to Hong Kong after two COVID-riddled years. So if you want to hear my little two-bit theory that is hitting me as I read this, what if, so India was buying a bunch of oil from Russia and reselling it to Europe as a way to get energy over to Europe and circumventing the whole sanctions on Russia, right? I mean, we all basically heard about that at least a few months ago. They must have made a fortune. And what if they put a lot of that money into gold? And maybe they're putting it into silver too. Let's continue. Indians bought historically low amounts of silver in 2020 and 2021 as supply chains and demand were hit by virus outbreaks, while consumers rushed to jewelry stores to buy gold in last year's final quarter when pandemic restrictions eased, pushing sales to an all-time high, silver demand grew by less than 25%. This year, silver sales are back on track. Local purchases may surpass 8,000 tons in 2022 from about 4,500 tons last year, said Shirag Sheth, principal consultant at Metals Focus. That's up from an April estimate of 5,900 tons. So April's estimate was 5,900 tons, and they may surpass 8,000 tons. So, you know, 2,100 tons extra. Quote, we are seeing a jump in purchases among retail customers, similar to what we saw in gold last year because of pent-up demand. Well, there is definitely excitement out there for silver, and you wonder how much that is factoring in investment demand on the silver market. Those are your news stories. Now let's take a look at metal prices. Turning to metal prices, we'd like to thank our friends at mining.com slash markets for providing us with these prices each and every week. And on November 8th, gold is trading at $1,681.30 per ounce. That is $33 higher than last week. Silver is trading at $20.85 per ounce. That is $1.16 higher than last week. Platinum is trading at $965.99 per ounce. That is $22 higher than last week. And palladium is trading at $1,869.45 per ounce. That is $2 lower than last week. Turning to our industrial metals, copper is trading seven cents lower at $3.41 per pound. Aluminum is unchanged at $1.01 per pound. Lead is two cents higher at 90 cents per pound. Nickel is 37 cents higher at $10.46 per pound. Tin is nine cents lower at $8.21 per pound. Cobalt is a penny lower at $23.25 per pound. And zinc is 10 cents lower at $1.22 per pound. Zooming out, gold, silver, and platinum are higher whereas almost all your industrial metals are lower or unchanged. Is there an exception? Lead is a couple of cents higher, and nickel is also higher. But other than that, everything is down a little bit. It's a bit risk-offish, a little bit of uncertainty here. I mean, it really feels like industrial metals are treading water, whereas gold, particularly silver, is recovering a little bit, but nothing special on gold. I mean, let's face it, we're still below $1,700 an ounce. Silver, though, as many people are bullish, you know, almost at $21 there. And those are your metal prices. And coming up, we have Bort Longyear, President and CEO Jeff Olson, joining the program for the first time 
and he gives a fascinating interview on the state of the global mining industry, the impacts of inflation, which part of the globe he sees the most growth, which is totally fascinating, and the future of drilling, including developments in artificial intelligence and real-time on-site data processing. I hope you enjoy this interview, and I will see you on the other side. Joining me today, I am extremely pleased to welcome Jeff Olson, President and CEO of Bort Longyear to the Northern Miner Podcast. He has never been on the program before, and it is long overdue. Jeff, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. This is a company that I have sort of seen on the periphery of just working on, you know, at the Northern Miner for the last 10 years. It's always kind of around, and I know it's a basically a supplier of sorts, but for people and even myself, who want to know more, how would you describe your company? How would you describe what you do? Great. Well, Bort Longyear is a fantastic company with a fantastic reputation. It's been around for 130 years. So in the mining industry, people know us very well. Some people know us very much as a mining drilling services provider. We do drilling services around the world, and that is about 70% of our business. About 30% of our business is products. So we have both exploration tooling products, percussive or production tooling products. Some people call those rock tools. And we also supply capital equipment, so rigs into the industry, which of course we supply those products to our really the the same industry we compete against in drilling services. So those are the two parts of our business that people are very familiar with. The third part of our business, which we've been growing over the last few years, is the technology business. And we are very excited about some of the tools that we have there and some of the technology that we're introducing to the mining industry, which we think is very game changing and will uh, have a big impact on the way processes are done in the mining industry going forward. So been around for a long time. We work in uh, every continent. We drill in about 25 to 30 countries. We sell our products in over 100 countries. So, um, you know, in some parts of the world, we're very recognizable. Uh, we are uh, headquartered in Salt Lake City, but we're listed in uh, Australia on the Australian Exchange. Okay, excellent. Well, that gives us a nice roundabout view of what you're up to. So just to clarify then, uh, just so everybody's on the same page, in a sense, we might say the focus of your business is drilling. Yeah, that's 70%. Uh, but uh, we, we're probably the only company out there that also has a strong products company to go along with a services company. And our technology business is, uh, we think, a a big part of our future going forward. Okay. And so by that, do you mean like, do you have products that say analyze rock samples, for example, or like what kinds of other products are are we we talking about? We have our offerings in our technology group really fall into two categories. They are down the hole tools that provide uh, information to the drillers and to the company about uh, drill holes drill path, all of those kinds of key information, uh, core orientation, gyro. Those are the kinds of tools that go in the hole and are a key part of that side of our technology business. And then we have a product which we call TrueScan, which is a on-the-spot assay tool that has very high integrity, very high accuracy, Scanning of core and chips, so we're the only people that can scan both core and chips, gives you elemental geochemistry. And in addition to that, we have tools that use uh, that information uh, with AI to do things like auto structural logging. So we go past, we're moving into the data acquisition and now the data analysis side of the business. Now, you can see the power of this if you can combine the information you get down the down the hole with the tools with the assay of the core or the chips on the surface and stitch those data sets together you can really start to provide a unified knowledge of what the ore body looks like and how it behaves and and all of those kinds of things so we think this is a very important part of our business going forward that is fascinating so tell us then how far has drilling come then like i mean we've seen and i guess there's different aspects to it i mean we've seen fracking for example in the last 
I guess we'd say the last 10 to 15 years, maybe last 10 years, uh, you'd know more than I would. Because in a sense, it's a very simple, at its core, it's a very simple technology. You're drilling a hole in the ground, right? And you're basically taking a sample. So has anything changed in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years? And you're kind of alluding to that a little bit. Are there sensors, for example? I guess you're taking more specific samples. Anyways, go for it. Uh, what's changed? Yeah, l l I mean, there has been significant changes. You know, fundamentally, their drilling has been similar for a very long time. You know, Fort Longyear was the one who pioneered things like wireline and pulling core out of the ground through wireline so you don't have to pull the uh, drill string. That technology has been around for a very long time, still used today. We have new technologies that we think would actually eliminate the wireline in, in what we do, but those aren't ready for market yet. But the mining industry has been fairly slow to adopt new technologies in the past. But with the pressures on mining now and in the future, then, uh, you know, particularly from an ESG perspective, or people want uh, a smaller environmental footprint, they want to also focus on safety issues, all the things that are important to miners today and how they improve how they do their work are ripe for technology to come in and help, right? So, you know, our strategy is always to come in and to make that process better. And sometimes these technologies are require changes at the mining company on how they do things. And that makes that change management process a little bit more difficult. And sometimes it's just about pulling new and improved rigs onto sites that, that have rod handling capabilities, that have remote operation capabilities that both help the productivity, but also help the safety aspects of drilling. Fascinating. Yeah, I suppose like every other business, you guys have to deal with the ESG side of things. And the more ESG friendly your your product is, the happier the mining companies are going to be, because I guess their scorecard would improve as a result. So with that, I mean, I have kind of a couple of questions, but I guess the first question is, you know, I've heard the criticism of, say, battery technology. One of the criticisms you might hear is that thing's not going to get like a 747 out of the air. We need kind of oil and gas for that kind of power. And that's maybe a debatable point. But is that true for drilling? Do you ever see drilling that's powered by batteries? Do you already have it or is that kind of a pipe dream? Well, we we certainly certainly it's not a, a pipe dream. You know, we're moving in that direction. In some cases, the remote nature of our operations in exploration uh, don't lend itself to that. But when we're drilling on a mine site, for example, you know, we have large rotary rigs that we hook up directly to the grid at a mine site. We don't use those diesel engines. That's a, a big step forward. We, we try to use those kinds of things. And there's lots of other areas that we can improve in. For example, having solar powered light plants, for example, right? Instead of uh, instead of running diesel engines to run, run those light plants, uh, each one of those kinds of incremental investments has a positive ESG impact. And the other side of it is, is trying to always reduce our footprint on site, right? The smaller the footprint, the less disruption that you have to the environment. And, and you know, our rigs are designed to do that, our operation are designed to do that. And managing those sites well from an environmental standpoint is certainly part of our values at Fort Longyear. So, yeah, ESG permeates everything that we do. Our hiring practices, the fact that we, we, we try to build rigs and create teams that allow for us to attract the other 50% of the population that hasn't traditionally been drillers like women. So there's some parts of the world where we have entirely women uh, populated drill teams. Right. Uh, the, we're, I think we're we're at the forefront of that at Bort Longyear. Uh, we certainly try to attract women into the mining industry and into drilling, but also into maintenance. Uh, we have we have women welders, uh, maintenance people. These are the kinds of things that we need to do in our industry to attract a broader spectrum of employees to our business. And there's things that we need to improve so that we are more attractive uh, to uh, to that diverse workforce facilities and things like that. And we've been very conscious about putting those facilities in everywhere around the world so that it, it enables uh, the attraction of, of women in the workforce and a more diverse workforce. So there's lots of aspects of ESG. You can sort of go down lots of different fingers of how it impacts the business, but we're very committed to it. We published our first ESG report this year. 
and we anticipate we'll improve upon that in the coming years, and we're very committed to the ESG principles of Fort Longyear. From your perspective then, so I mean, you guys are a major supplier of drilling equipment and other products, as we've discussed. What are you seeing? I mean, it's been such a strange year. We had with, uh, you know, in March after the war started, we had commodities go through the roof. And then we've seen kind of, a, to call it a crash is maybe an overstatement, but we saw them come down dramatically. And now they're kind of drifting up a little bit. What are you seeing from your perch as far as just the business of the industry in a sense? How's business for you and what are you seeing? Yeah, let me start with the big picture. I think the big picture is still very strong. I think the macro drivers of the mining industry uh, are still very favorable. The supply and demand for base metals and for the metals that support decarbonization are still very strong. Now, in any kind of a economic cycle, you will have what I would call more of a pause or a softening along the road. I don't think there's any any economic cycle that is uh, smooth up and then uh, you know smooth down. I think there's always going to be uh, some mini ups and downs. Certainly 2022 has been a strong year for us, but we've seen a little bit of weakening. Still growth, but less growth towards the second half of the year. Uh, I suspect that will continue. So we've had a good 2022. Uh, top line's been good both for our services and our products division. We anticipate that we're going to see those kinds of you know, not massive growth numbers in 2023, but, you know, still growth in 2023. Now, though, you, you mentioned inflation and all the issues in the supply chain disruption. You know, in our products business, we certainly have, uh, you know, we most of our products are made out of steel and we move that steel around the world. So steel prices have been extremely high uh, in uh, 2022. And that's impacted our costs in that business. Certainly, we've seen some some of those costs come off recently. And the other side of it is, is moving that around the world has cost a lot more in 2022. Also improving as we get to the second half of the year. But those factors are relating to some of these geopolitical issues around the world and, and supply chain disruptions. Uh, of course, we're still suffering from uh, longer lead times on component parts. When we build drill rigs, we depend upon a lot of suppliers for component parts. Uh, some of those supply lines have been lengthened considerably. I think they're also improving now, but um, those have been real challenges in 2022, uh, and we hope that that improves in, in 2023. But from a basic business activity level perspective, I'm fairly optimistic about where we're going in 2023 because our customers unlike other potential downturn periods, are fairly well delevered. There's not a lot of debt out in the mining industry. And they also have fairly low reserve positions. So if you're talking about drilling and replacing those reserves and you've got a delevered balance sheet, I get it, costs have gone up a bit, but the major miners know that it is important to improve those reserve positions. And so they're doing that. They're continuing to drill. They're continuing to try to improve those reserve positions because that's the long-term lifeblood of a mining company is to have those reserves in, in a strong position. And, and by and large, gold companies in particular have much lower reserve positions today than they did 10 or even five years ago. So uh, so they, they need to continue to drill and to replace those reserves. And those are good trends, good macroeconomic drivers for our business going forward in 2023, regardless of what short-term inflationary or recessionary uh, issues might impact the globe. Well, exactly. I mean, at the end of the day, we're going to need a bunch of metal yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's been underinvested in. So you guys are kind of pretty well positioned with that. Now, on this whole global front, like, would you consider yourself a global company? It sounds like it. Yeah, we're very global. We're the most global drilling uh, services company in the world. You know, we work in lots of different parts of the world, uh, Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, along with the first world areas like uh, Australia, Canada, and, 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 and the U.S. We drill in all of those parts of the world. We're very familiar. We've been there a long time, you know, and uh, so one of the things that we offer to our customers is a, is a global reach. And when you go on to a a Bort Longyear drill site, you know, our goal is to have it look very similar, whether it's sitting in the middle of Nevada or it, whether it's in the Congo, it'll, it'll look the same. Okay. And with that, then, is there an area of the world that you think is kind of 
particularly exciting? I mean, you guys look out and you go, okay, where do we see growth in our company, for example? Like, is Africa, like, I would think maybe Africa is a place that you see, like, kind of exciting, not only from your own business perspective, but for mining in general. Is there a place that kind of stands out a little bit or places? I'd probably put at the top of that list Latin America. And the reason why I do that is, is uh, if you look at the decarbonization trend, ESG principles, green metals, well, you know, the green metal, of course, is copper uh, because it's the best conductor. So where do you find massive opportunity for copper? It's going to be Latin America. So I'm very optimistic about Latin America going forward. And we are seeing some real improvement in 2022 in our Latin American business. And we think that's going to continue. Also Africa. Now, Africa is one of those areas where uh, it's not across all the countries in Africa. Some of them are facing other geopolitical issues, but uh, we find Africa a very uh, prospective place going forward and, and are committed to where we're doing business there now. Now, uh, I can tell you that, you know, I, I'm still pretty optimistic about the U.S. Uh, growth has been a little less in Canada this year, a little less in Australia this year. You know, I think there are drivers for that that are pretty uh, easy to understand. For example, you know, during the COVID period, there wasn't much of a downturn in Australia. So there isn't as much of a growth appetite in Australia at the moment. And inflation, of course, is a, is a driver in Australia. In Canada, there's been less money going into the junior market. And of course, that means that uh, there's a lot of junior activity in Canada, which uh, means that growth in Canada will, is, a, is a bit softer uh, than it had been in 2021. But I, I think that'll turn around in 2022 as well. And on that point, you mentioned the juniors. I assume you guys service basically from the very top. I mean, I think I saw in your bio that you were at Rio Tinto before. Like, do you serve like the very highest or do they have their own drill rigs or how, how does that work? They, they generally employ professionals like uh, Bort Longyear to do that drilling. Uh, so yes, uh, I would say about 70% of our our activity on the services side of our, our business is with major miners. Now, of course, everybody defines majors a little differently, but we would say 70%, about 30% with juniors. Um, and so we service both markets, but we're probably particularly uh, well suited to uh, service the major miners because we have very well established processes and in particular safety, we're the best safety record in the drilling industry. And uh, they love our processes and our safety systems. And I think that's a, a big advantage, as well as our global reach and the fact that we do all kinds of drilling. So, you know, if, if we're not just a core driller. Uh, we're not just an RC driller. You know, we do large rotary. We do underground. We do percussive. We do sonic. We do it all directional. We do all of these kinds of drillings wherever you're at. And major miner is going to use all those services. And so that that's an attractive thing for them as well. Fascinating. And we have a, like our bread and butter here at the Northern Miner are a lot of these junior mining companies. And maybe a lot of them already know the answer to this question, but maybe I don't. Like, how does one go about getting a drill? Do they simply contact you? And I mean, it sounds like an infomercial and that's not what I'm trying to do here, but I'm just genuinely uh, wondering how do people set that up? Like, I guess you just contact you guys and you say, these are your products and we can bring them on at this point. Yeah, absolutely. You, you just give Bort Longyear a call and uh, we'll uh, get you to the right area of our business. Of course, you know, we, uh, our drilling services is very regionally based. Uh, so if you contact the, the headquarters of Bort Longyear, we'll quickly get to you, get you to the right region where we can help you. And, and they can tell you what their capacity is to help you. And, and what their uh, capabilities are. So yeah, um, we'll, we'll be happy to help with any of that uh, opportunity. When people need some drilling, uh, we're happy to, uh, uh, to see what we can do to help and we'd always like to help. We work with all different customers. We love the junior miners as well. Again, there's been a little bit of a softening in that market in Canada this year, but that's a great market for us generally. And we count on it throughout the, board long, the cycle, uh, mining cycle for us, particularly in Canada. And we think we're well placed because we have a good team in Canada that very experienced and able to uh, service the needs of uh, both the majors and the juniors. And on that point, do you ever find that like I'm sure when there are times when like we hear actually in the industry, there are times when you can't find enough people, for example, to work on your site and sometimes even the drills. Uh, do you ever run out of drills in a sense or 
What yeah. about the whole supply and demand of drilling side of things? So what yeah. do you see there? Uh, absolutely. Certainly, the, the utilization rates in the drilling industry have come up tremendously in the last couple of years. So if you're talking about certain drill types in certain regions, we would be completely out of capacity. In other drill types, we might still have uh, capacity. And, uh, you know, we want to do the best for our customers that we can. So if we don't think we can staff it with the seasoned drillers that we need to have on a project, we may uh, delay a project or ask to do it a bit later while we free up some resources. But uh, that's certainly been the issue in Canada over the last few months is, is drillers. We believe as Bort Longyear, we have a competitive advantage in attracting those new drillers to the business. And we also believe that our biggest competitive advantage is, is training and developing those people in the organization. So, you know, I, I, we, we spend a tremendous amount of effort on training the development of our drillers. And so, you know, we think we have the best drillers in the world. And sorry, just to clarify on that, do you provide people then? Or do you, I would assume you just provide the equipment, but are you saying that you in fact oh, provide also the people? We, we do, all, we provide all the people as well. Yeah. Fort Long, oh, that is fascinating. 6,000 6, employees worldwide. And a lot mm -hmm. of those would be employed in the drilling services side. Interesting. So part of the business is actually contracting you out basically, hey, we need some drilling at land XYZ. Yes, that's exactly right. That would be uh, Fascinating. Fact, that's probably one of the bigger parts of our business. So, yeah. Oh, sure. And so interesting. Okay. So as we wrap up here, I guess a couple of things, and I don't know if you can answer this question, but I'll start with this one and then I'll wrap up with my final question. You know, Mark Bristow, the CEO of Barrick Gold, he talks about these kind of declining grades, or I believe he said that in the past. And, you know, it's a common sort of thing that's discussed in the industry of these it's harder to get like all the nice deposits, the nice juicy deposits have been basically discovered for the most part. As someone who's on the front line of drilling, I mean, from what I understand of what you're telling me here, would you concur? Like what is the state of, you know, deposits as you guys see them? Is it harder to get the metal that we're looking for? Is there going to be a kind of resource scarcity or what are you seeing? There's a number of macro trends. You're right. Um, you know, as mines get older, they generally decline in grade. And then sometimes there's also on uh, open pit mines, a transition to underground mining after the fact, right? So we respond to all of those uh, kinds of needs in the drilling industry. And I think, you know, Mark's right, there, there generally has been declining grades. That's generally good for drilling because uh, you need to drill more to find more. And so uh, the intensity of drilling will tend to follow to improve with that trend going forward. So, you know, I think there are still plenty of new deposits to find out there. We're going to have to work a little harder to find those. And sometimes they're going to be in frontier countries, which makes it a little tougher to to uh, to mine. But uh, the world is going to need those metals. So we're going to have to do the work to find them. Okay, excellent. So if you have time for one more question, uh, do you have time sure. for one more question? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So you mentioned AI before. And so my question for you in the context of AI and even beyond it, uh, where do you see drilling going as you look out, uh, you know, a decade or two and just the direction of the company, this over 100 year old company, where are things going from your perspective? It's in so far as the drilling business and AI and all this business. Well, I, I think technology is going to play a big role uh, going forward in our industry. It's going to change the way we find and define ore bodies. The goal of all that would be to speed that process up. It hasn't been fast enough when we've been talking here about the need to find more metals and mining. And I, and I think that's going to be the big driver for that technology. So if you can drill a hole, get the results very quickly and decide whether you want to drill a second hole or to move that rig to a different place, uh, that certainly speeds the process. You know, today, if you're in a remote place and you're drilling core and then you ship that core back, you know, for example, let's say you're drilling in Erie and Jaya and you ship that core all the way back to the U.S. to get it analyzed. Well, there's, there's a three month turnaround there. If you can get those answers with our TrueScan technology in 30 minutes over satellite data transfer, uh, that geo can look at that data much more higher quality in terms of seeing those high definition pictures, as well as the elemental analysis, as well as the auto structural logging information that we developed through AI. 
he can make decisions much quicker and the ability to develop ore bodies out there faster is going to be a big trend in the mining industry and is going to be uh, necessary to meet the demands of, uh, of a new green world. So if I understand you right, basically, if you can get the data, it's going to be more data rich and more, more real time, because if you can get that data immediately, you can make a decision within 30 minutes. You know what? Let's drill 100 meters that way rather than waiting three months and then getting everybody home and then getting it shipped back out. Like that's the idea, yeah, right? Exactly. Exactly. It saves, saves the mining company a lot of time and a lot of money. All right, and that's uh, that's going to speed up the process. Fascinating. Well, Jeff Olson, president and CEO of Port Longyear, thank you for joining us on this week's edition of the Northern Miner Podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation, Adrian. Once again, to Jeff Olson and Port Longyear for joining us on this week's program. And thank you, dear listener, for listening once again. If you want to learn more about the Canadian Mining Symposium and other conferences we work on here at the Northern Miner, just go to events.northernminer.com. If you want to help with the podcast, leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory. Share it with your friends. Until next week, take care.